That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about An Unmarried Woman, the 1978 classic directed by Paul Mazursky, which will be making its Blu-ray debut uh, on the Criterion Collection June 9th, 2020. What is this movie about? Well, well, first, oh. I guess logistics uh, premiered uh, at the 1978 Cannes Film Festival. Uh, Miss Cla this is considered Miss Claiborne's signature role. Um, she, uh, she won Best Actress at Cannes, tied with Isabelle Huppert for Violet. Uh, she was also nominated for an Academy Award. It was nominated for Best Picture, Best Screenplay. Uh, so it was. Uh, it's a part of the cultural zeitgeist for certain of 1978. Okay, what is it about? It's about a, a woman uh, who, uh, who's been married for 16, going on 17 years in uh, the Upper East Side uh, in Manhattan. And her husband, played by Michael Murphy, says, I've fallen in love with another woman at Blue that I met at Bloomingdale's and I would like a divorce. And uh, so sets herself off on a trajectory of discovering who she really is and what it is she really wants. So why is this movie uh, worthy of a Criterion release? Uh, well, the Clayburgh's uh, celebrated performance, and I, I think I probably do like her performance more than you do. Uh, this is the second time I've seen this film, but I, I think um, considering this came out of the new Hollywood movement, the new Hollywood of the 1970s, where we had auteurs, directors, and auteurs uh, who were trying to dismantle the studio system, and where women's voices kind of uh, felt in there because that, we, we look back on this period as and this was a period where anything could happen but really it didn't really it was still just white men making films but where it, there's even a, a segment in here where Clayburgh and her three friends are bemoaning the fact that where are the Betty Davises and the Joan Crawfords and the Barbara Stanwyck's because back in the studio era there were at least women's pictures but in, even in the New Hollywood movement they talk about Jane Fonda and Barbara Stan Streisand, but it's not the same. Where, where are the representations of women? And this is, this is kind of one of those strong uh, representations of a, a, a woman. Okay, so let's break down the story. So the woman, what's her character's name? Erica. Erica Benton. So she's this rich white woman who works like a bullshit ass job in a gallery just to keep herself busy part time. Yeah. Her husband's a wealthy, like well to do stock broker. Mm -hmm. He tells her that he's fallen in love with a younger woman, so he's going to, and she wants to be married, so he's leaving her. But he still cares about his wife and still wants to be a part of her life, but mm -hmm. he needs to move on. And they have a precocious daughter. And they have a daughter Patty. who's 15. Um, so he leaves, she kind of tries to move on. The, the first half of the film is kind of her just interacting with her friends, um, interacting with her daughter. She starts to see a therapist, mm -hmm. and the therapist recommends that she try to like um, put herself out there with men. Mm -hmm. Because she says it's been seven weeks, she's so lonely, she hasn't had sex. So she hooks up with a gentleman who is a customer of her art gallery, mm -hmm. played by... Cliff Gorman from The Boys in the Band. And he's kind of like not very appealing to her, so she kind of rebuffs him, but eventually does um, have a casual sexual encounter with him. Mm -hmm. She then moves on to a artist at her gallery, so mm -hmm. she doesn't go far to find these men. And he's played by... Alan Bates. And he's much more appealing, more mm -hmm. handsome, obviously... Rugged, uh, sympathetic. Rugged. Yeah, yeah, a nicer guy. She... Um, their relationship evolves very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and the last third of the film is her, he and the two of them sort of like developing this really strong bond. He wants her to move in with him, basically marry him. And she's struggling with the idea of like, does she want to go back to being this like married woman with no life mm -hmm. or does she want to move on and, and become something? And stay an unmarried woman. Yeah. She with wants to explore herself. Mm -hmm. and. Be stimulated she even says probably one of the only memorable lines I can think of is her saying uh, because he says like come away with me we can do all these things and she's like I was on vacation for 16 years mm -hmm. yeah. which I think is a perfect analogy for how I feel about this movie because it's just like this rich white lady <laughs> yeah for sure for with sure. no struggles like her life was a vacation and now it just seems like she's bored with that doing that so now she wants now she wants to do something but ultimately she decides not to um, 
it's not that she breaks up with him. She just says, I'm not going to move with you. He wants, he spends like five months every summer in Vermont working on his art. She's like, I'm not doing that. She gets her own place. Mm -hmm. And then the film just moves kind of, the assumption is she kind of moves on to be more independent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go over your little list. What do you have? Uh, well, uh, there's, there's kind of a lot to unpack in this film, really, even though the, the story is basic and bland, but I think you have to take into uh, account 1978, where we are as a country, uh, what, what kind of representations there are of, of women, for women. Um, it certainly you had like Cassavetti's A Woman Under the Influence and Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, but this really seems tool. Like, I really liked her scenes with a therapist played by uh, Penelope Rushenoff, where, you know, she's, she's talking about her first experiences uh, when she starts menstruating and, and, and all these things that we probably watch today and take for granted that were probably more meaningful and kind of revolutionary sounding then. Um, and Clayburg, I, I think, gives a really great performance as somebody that's very disoriented and she doesn't, the push and pull of her uh, emotions versus uh, her logic, like I think is an apparent in most of these sequences, but you also can't neglect the fact that this is a very privileged woman in a very a particular time and place who, no matter what happens to her, is always going to be okay. Yeah. And, and I think that's what kind of makes this seem like th this was a film for a certain type of woman then that didn't, is certainly not for every woman. No, you could spend a lot of time explaining why this film and this character and this role, like the significance, which is valid. I agree with it. But I think in reality, particularly watching it in 2020, it just she's not very captivating to me. I don't think her performance shows a lot of range. She's not a very passionate no, the, the like the characterization is not passionate. She's not passionate when she's upset. She's not passionate when she's having no. sex. She's not passionate when she's happy. No, and I think that the, the the I think the best scenes really are with the therapist because she, the, the, she describes her sex life with Michael Murphy as being like wild and passionate. And the therapist says, "Well, how so?" And then she gets very defensive and puts up all these walls. And the therapist is like, "You're getting really angry." Because I, to me, well, I took that, I, to me, I took that as like she's kind of realizing maybe she doesn't know what passion means. She doesn't know what she she doesn't know anything about herself. You are making much more sense and being much like you are uh, explaining it more than I think the film is showing it because I don't think she was that defensive. She just seemed like someone who's like, I don't want to talk about that, so I'm not going to. Like, she's not devastated and experiencing like this trauma from this experience. She's just like kind of saying, like, I don't want to talk about that. But then she has no problem talking about sex or fucking strangers any other time. So, no, no but it's, it's almost like a teenager though. Like, like she, she goes, you're right. Like, like she has been able, like, she has been stuck in this bubble in this certain role and it's almost like she's she's regressed a little bit because she starts talking and that's not exactly the word I want to use either but like with the scene you really didn't like where Alan Bates is throwing paint all over the apartment and she's like I want to go to India and Persia and Greece it's it's like she's rediscovering a part of her life that was closed off to her and you're right seems like a teenager almost but um, I, I think there are a lot of positive messages in it it's just that Compared to, I, I brought up immediately in my notes, Marriage Story. This feels like um, something that uh, Noah Baumbach, uh, of course, would have revered and also liked. Um, to and I would say film. the difference with Marriage Story is that the dialogue and the characterizations, because in Marriage Story, they're also privileged people. Sure. Um, but the, the dialogue and the characterizations, I feel like, are very they're broad enough that like anyone can relate. Right. I'd be very curious to know what other people think about an unmarried woman and her characterization because it just seems like someone can like you can do a very good job of like analyzing it and breaking it down. It makes perfect sense. Oh, thanks. But I don't think that like me watching the experience of watching it, I want to wrap this up for myself. So I'm just going to say my, <laughs> my main thought is the story's very good. Sure. Like if you write down a detailed sort of plot synopsis, I would say it's like a very good story, but the execution of it and the, and the casting it, and the, a lot of the acting, I did not think was exceptional. Well, and Clayburgh wasn't somebody that I was uh, gravitated towards as a child, as say like even a Jane Fonda, who they bring up and I think is funny she lost the Oscar to Jane Fonda that year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, Clayburgh's last movie was as Kristen Wiig's mother in Bridesmaids. She's married to David Rabe, the award-winning playwright. He, okay. he wrote Hurley Burley, which Sigourney Weaver got her Tony nod for. Uh, and their daughter's Lily Rabe. Um, it reminds me of uh, uh, 
like Sebastian Lilo's Gloria and the remake Gloria Bell, um, Isabel Huppert and Things to Come, just these... It, Again, Things to Come, I prefer because that characterization seems more authentic. I do too. I prefer that film as right. well. But I just don't think An Unmarried Woman seems like relatable or there are themes and, symbol and, and symbols that are obviously uh, effective, but I think overall it's, it just seems very like way over there for very specific. It's, it's aged a lot differently um, compared to something like... You know who I think will relate to this movie? That lady who... Uh, that podcast and movie, Dear John. That lady in Orange County. Who yes, yes, and I brought that up while we were watching it. Yeah, She mm -hmm. would think this is a good... Like, yeah. she would say that it's riveting and she can relate. Mm -hmm. it, but, but any average woman, working woman with a teenage daughter who whose husband has left her and she needs to figure her life out, would think that this bitch is like <laughs> the luckiest woman in the world. Yes, yes. And, and, and it, her biggest complaint is like, you know. And I can't argue with that. And I'm not trying to. No, you're uh, not. But, and it certainly hasn't aged as well as like Mazursky's debut with Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice and kind of the, the, the sexual dynamics of this couple that's considering changing partners. Uh, certainly that film still seems a lot more revolutionary, I think. Uh, than than an unmarried woman does now, and the Mazursky title you've seen before is Down and Out in Beverly Hills, okay. by the way, with uh, Bette Midler. Um, a shout out to Novella Nelson; she's the one black woman kind of with a speaking role as Jean. Um, okay. uh, I recall her from an episode in Thirty Rock that was kind of memorable. Um, and then I couldn't quite place my finger on it. The white man she's dating at Raymond J. Barry is uh, the mayor in Nothing But Trouble. Um, and uh, yeah, Cliff Gorman, Michael Murphy, uh, I, I've always been a fan of Alan Bates. Uh, Grant, I think that liking them in this is probably more for nostalgia and other films than what they really get to do here, because this is really, I, I think, meant to be a showcase for uh, Jill Clayburgh. Um, so yeah, what would you give this film? Three out of five, but only because of its like s significance. I, I tend towards three and a half out of five. Um, I'm not really ba a fan of the Bill Conti score. Uh, it was shot by Arthur J. Ornitz, who also shot Boys in the Band uh, in Serpico. Uh, it's got a 2005. The, so I give it three and a half out of five. I'll give Criterion's release of it, uh, the new 4K restoration, four out of five. There's a 2005 uh, commentary track uh, from Mazursky and Jill Clayburgh. They're both dead now, uh, unfortunately. There are new interviews with uh, Michael Murphy and Lisa Lucas, who played the daughter Patty. Uh, there's a, an interview with author Sam Wasson, and then there's a 1981 um, uh, snippets from uh, AFI from Mazursky. Okay, all done. Yeah, we're done. All right, bye. Bye.